Hello everyone and welcome back to this series where a lot of interesting people tell you about them so that you can learn and have fun doing it because they are fun people and we're gonna have fun for the next couple of minutes learning more about the amazing world of animation. And today I have another special guest like I do every day and we have Chris Fern here who will be telling you about what he does. <laughs> Hi, thanks for having me. Um... You, uh, you're in, you're in Montreal. I'm in Vancouver. And uh, what do I do? What do I do, Marie? Marie, Eve? What do I, what do I do? What did you, what do you do? Well, usually you, <laughs> you do, which is a good I thing. I do. I do a lot of do's. Um, yeah. So um, I, I, I guess you could, you could call me a story artist by trade, but um, you know, I, 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 I've directed a few things, and I like to write. And I uh, used to uh, do a bit of design, and I, uh, I kind of bounce around from one studio to the next. And, Try to make cartoons. Try to make try to make people laugh. I think that's maybe what I do. And sometimes I fail. Sometimes I succeed. Is that um, an okay introduction? <laughs> it is a perfect introduction. And just out of context, yeah, we met during a workshop that you gave in uh, Quebec City some years ago. That's a lot of years ago. Yeah, and yeah, it was. And um, <laughs> I think that was uh, what was it, 2015, 2016? 2013 or 14, actually, because I was still in school. Ah! <laughs> oh, it was a while ago. It was a while ago. I okay. <laughs> time, time flies. And you were giving a very cool talk about storyboard. And, you know, back then I still wanted to be a storyboard artist, but I figured that that was not for me. So I did something else, but that's great. Um, mm -hmm. At least I tried. <laughs> and you gave a wonderful talk about storyboard. So now that I have a youtube channel thing going on i thought i'd give a call to you know if you wanted to come by and share a bit of your experience and i'm really happy that you accept it so thank you for being here today yay well thank thank you for having me it's a real honor to be here and to sit and draw with you <laughs> yeah so so you're how long have you had the youtube channel up? almost exactly a year i started i started end of october uh, last year so it's been a year and then a few months and nice. it's crazy how fast it grew and i think that just tells how much people need more accessible education in our <laughs> industry yeah it's definitely like there's it's a smaller world but um you know there's still uh there's still a lot of gatekeepers i think in terms of like getting into the business and it's cool to have these opportunities to just talk about what we do so thank you and <laughs> it's always great to learn and do like very um useful stuff but it's also the whole day so mm -hmm. i have a few <laughs> questions for you um you know it's uh we were a big christmas family when i was a kid and uh you know we always do the the tree and the decorations and stuff so nothing really too out there in terms of um you know weird stuff i i always i always kind of like these days associate the holidays with uh, getting down into the woods to to cut firewood and uh, that's like my favorite thing in the world to do and it depends on how the winter is whether or not it's cold back east um, but uh, I like I like the uh, yeah I like I like it when we get a good winter and you can go down into the woods and it's really cold and you can kind of work all day and then come home and just have some you know a, a hot toddy or a, a spicy rum by the fire from freshly cut wood and, and that to me always feels like Christmas, you know, in a weird way. Um, how about you? Uh, what I love uh, when it's the holiday time, usually we get a, we, we get together, all the family, and there's always that game that we always play each year. It's different each year. Uh, I know one time, some, I know a few years ago it was like Run Bowl, which is a kind of a race game with colorful people. Another year mm -hmm. it was Overcooked. Um, another year it was the Munchkin board game. So we always have like that game that we keep playing every night for like a week. And after that, we don't want to talk about it ever again. But <laughs> 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 yeah, it's really big get together where we do, uh, if the weather allows, uh, snowboarding. But usually winter is getting later and later each year. So <laughs> the, yeah, usually the snowboarding I... is more in January than in December. <laughs> Yeah, it, it does feel like it's moved back a, a month or two, doesn't it? Yep. In terms of the snow. But yeah, it's all about yep. get, getting together and cooking food. I cook so much food during the holiday time. It's crazy. Nice. Nice. It's nice to take a break and, and uh, do something different and draw cartoons. Oh, but yes. Oh, yes. 2020 has been one heck of a year for many reasons. Um, but I always... It's been a hard year. Yeah. I always want to think about positive thing so is there something really positive and amazing that occurred during this year <laughs> well i think you know for um 
from my life on the work side, had a movie come out in April through uh, Netflix, which was my first film I'd ever, you know, uh, finished for, for that platform. And uh, ironically, everybody was home. So, and it was kind of early in the pandemic. So it was, it was pretty good timing for, I think, putting a funny movie into the world. And, you know, we got a lot of nice um, response from the audience and hit a pretty, uh, pretty, uh, pretty good, you know, just kind of opportunity to talk to people at a, at a time when I think the world was shut down. So it was, uh, that was kind of, that was kind of good. And then I started a new job, but uh, with the new job, I'm now working remote. So it is really cool. Like I miss people and I miss being in a studio, but I love the fact I can work with artists from kind of all over the world, which we have been doing for a while. I mean, the industry's been sort of heading this direction, but mm -hmm. um, I don't know. There's just something about everybody doing it, which, which creates this sort of opportunity for just, I don't know, just, just interesting collaborations. And so it's been a really fun year as far as the, the the collaborations go. I'm very grateful to be in animation where we um, where we can keep going to. Oh yeah. I, you know, in terms of like, and I and I and it, there is a lot of gratitude I feel towards this. And I know it's a, it's it's a hard time for for many people, and I and I you know I, I just you, you see it out there in the world, and you have to kind of go well at least you know uh, at, at least um, at least we can still keep going and and you know hopefully keep making stuff that will cheer people up and mm -hmm. and um you know i don't know this it feels like this is a good time for storytelling in terms of we need it we, we need to have frames of reference what do you want to talk about today what, what should we talk about? okay so what i want to talk about today is two things maybe three that are kind of intertwined mm -hmm. uh because i know you directed okay. a movie recently like you said the willoughby which was a um mm -hmm. on and honestly not to be uh uh cheesy or sappy is that the word uh i really think it's one of my top five favorite movie i really loved it it took me by surprise because oh. <laughs> i went into it just thinking oh well, yeah i'm gonna have fun it's a nice family movie but yeah it was just really it's really different hmm? it was it was a weird film it was it's a I, you know i uh was lucky that Netflix let us keep it weird and, and you know, we were able to talk about something that um, means a lot to me. Um, so it's uh, this idea of the family you're born into versus the family you choose. No matter what mistakes we make in life, we can all choose. We can all fix ourselves. We can find love. That's an important, an important thing to talk about, I think. Yeah. And yeah, it took me by surprise. I thought it was super different and really interesting. So, um, yeah, congrats on making that movie. But with making movie comes a lot of Thank you. <laughs> come lots of challenge and things that people maybe don't know about and don't expect. Um, Cause a lot of the things we know about um, directing a movie is usually the kind of feature it we get it <laughs> we get into DVDs where they're like, yeah, this is directing and super fun. It's just us traveling and having nice dinners and you know, I'm like no that's yeah. more than that so I thought we could uh, talk about it because I know you've done so many things like from storyboard from story from doing workshops and pitching stuff but yeah I think today we can kind of try to focus on uh, directing and pitching because that sometimes comes together so I have a few questions about both yeah. of these things well, I think I mean uh, I think the, the 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 process of building a movie is such an interesting journey, and it doesn't necessarily happen like you know it's not like mushrooms growing in the woods. Like it, it's there's a lot of humans involved and a lot of uh, learning that goes with the adaptation of anything, whether it's a, an original script or whether it's like in the case of Willoughby's, we were we were taking a book and we were turning it into a a film so uh, you know our, our the, the process that i really love that i think is somewhat you know kind of hard to um hard to to know about without actually going through it is the idea of um um you know finding a movie finding a story at the same time as designing a story at the same time as like you know finding the voices for the characters like so there's the what happens in the movie but there's also like all of that entertainment that kind of uh, is hanging off of that what and 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 to me it's a conversation with a lot of different people over many years and that conversation is is um is always changing and and the hardest thing about the process for being 
a director, I think, is sometimes you have to be a bit of a, a bit of a politician, but you also have to like listen to your audience. And like it, if it if you compare it to stand up comedy, like if you tell a joke to an audience and they don't laugh, it's not you. It's not their fault. It's your fault. Like you have to fix your your material and you have to hone your material and stand up comedians talk about it like it takes it takes years to get an hour or to get 20 minutes mm -hmm. i mentor a lot of students sometimes when they and not even students sometimes it's also professional when they want to pitch their their ideas if the joke don't get across <laughs> sometimes i hear well it's, it's just because like they don't understand my humor i'm like well if they don't understand your humor who will like you know of course yeah. you have to have confidence in yourself but you know be open to what people think yeah and i think like the, you know it's like writing is rewriting and and there is a point where you can say no this is this is where my waterline is this is this is the story and um sometimes it's even a case like where Um, I always go to jokes because it's an easy thing to understand, but like even say like um, we had a screening on the Willoughby's in 2018 and one of the feedback uh, consistencies I got from an audience that was really cold to our movie was that our main character, Tim, was mean. And there was a meanness to the movie that we never really intended to uh, to kind of create and like i was like the the humor was subversive and i i, I like the idea of a dark story with dark humor um but i wanted to make sure that the film felt funny and it was kind of coming off as dark in a way that wasn't funny so we had to listen to that audience and so i didn't really rewrite the story to to water it down i didn't go towards the direction of trying to make everybody happy but i really wanted to make sure that the audience empathized with my hero so when i when i'm getting the the notion that like the film is feeling mean it means that i'm not getting a rooting empathy from my audience so i have to look at what why that is and so some of it was tone some of it was like you know uh some plot points that just needed to be pivoted uh mm -hmm. sometimes it's where you put the camera like uh like having the camera on my character Sometimes it's like you put the camera where the dialogue is, and then sometimes you put the camera on the reaction. And if you put the camera on the reaction, sometimes you're telling the audience what a, what a character's feeling in a way that's nonverbal that allows the audience to care about that character, to understand what they want or how they, how they're, like where that insecurity is or where that vulnerability is in the character. And I think we, we had to go through the process of, of having a number of, you know, I would say, you know, not perfect screenings for the sake of learning about our film so we could constantly be improving. And that constant improvement is like they say, writing is rewriting, you know, it's the same thing. And that, that to me is the creative process. And I think as I've gotten more comfortable in my own skin, I'm much more um, embracing of that because, you know, you, you say we're talking about teaching and stuff like you remember being, Uh, a young artist and you're starting out in the business and you uh, you know you cover your page because you want to make the drawing perfect before you show it to a director oh yes that that doesn't stop you from getting the feedback getting the notes and and there's a there's an old saying you know it's like fail early fail often fail cheaply that's a key part of the process that I think is important because what we can't do is get cold to the material we're already like you have to have a point of view and you get biased when you when you put something down on paper but until you get a feedback that's that's honest you don't really know whether it's good or bad completely I mean you you, you might know your idea is good but are you communicating it in a way that's making it better does that make sense it absolutely does And the thing about failing early, failing cheaply, I do remember you telling me that years ago. And it, it really did something. I was like, okay, it's time to make my mistakes because I'm a, I'm a student. And yeah, that was, that was a big, yeah. Thank you for saying that because it did change something. <laughs> <laughs> it's important too when you're building a crew. I, I, I think like casting is 90% of, um, of most jobs, you know, but like if you can get a collaborative Um, you know, group of people. And I'm, when I say collaborative, it's like I don't really want everybody to agree with me. Like I really want to be challenged on the material. But if, they, if, if you get the right kind of people who care, like my production designer, Kyle McQueen, he's, he cared about the movie. And so like anytime we would argue over something, whether it's, um, you know, a design or a story point, it's coming from a place of caring about the movie. And so it's not like the, the ego needs to be put at the door. You know, in a way, so that we were all advocating for the same thing, which is how do we how do we tell the best version of this story? And at the end of the day, you never will. It's never nothing's ever perfect. 
you just try to hang on to your intent and go through the process and constantly be listening, I think is, is, is a big part of, for me, it's a big part of the job, listening, even though I'm probably not proving that by this conversation because I'm talking a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I got you in for talking. Like, I also have to not talk too much because I tend to get in direction that goes off. <laughs> All right, so I'll get a couple of questions here for you. Sure. Um, Let's start a new drawing. Should I start a new drawing? How does your storyboarding experience comes in handy when directing? Because directors come from different craft and you happen to come from mm -hmm. storyboard. So how does that intertwine? Well, I mean, uh, you know, to be honest with you, I started as an animator. So I was an, like being an animator helped me as a story artist. And then, um, you know, in terms of what the skill set evolution is like it's all filmmaking right so as an animator you are basically an actor with a pencil so your job is to you know take a scene and try to turn it into a performance and then as a story artist you're stepping one you're, you're basically it's stepping one one move back and it's you're building the scene so it's like you're taking the words from a script or a blank page and you're putting a camera in the set and you're you're still creating a stage and creating an opportunity for performance. You're just not finishing that thought. And so if you go towards the director chair, like literally it's the next step backwards from the story. So as a storyboard artist, like I was always told, you, you're the director. When you, when, you, when you get a script and you're off to build your storyboard, you have to think like a filmmaker. That's your job is to, is to put the camera in a place that sort of tells a story. And... Um, as a director, that is a big part of your job. So learning that point of view from being a story artist for years is was 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 really helpful. And very much like in story, like I think, you know, you, you're responding to the blank page. So I always talk about like the blank page is probably my scariest moment because like what do we, what do you do? Like like it could be anything. And until you start making mistakes, until you start you know taking away that blank page, you really you know your point of view can can travel and very wide swings and I think like you know that creative process of just starting to lay camera down starting to you know explore tone and 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 shot progression and 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 like all of the the the, the mechanics of being a story artist it's 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 the same process as like you know when you start writing script you're just you you start with one word and you put another word behind it and you you start kind of building out this story mm -hmm. um I think the biggest difference between directing and, and being a story artist is as a story artist, like my, my job is often to, to A, execute what is in the script and what's in the story, but also to, to you know, um, challenge it and to, and to kind of like, I was always like kind of going, what if, what if, what if, which is very important. But I, as a director, your job is also like to, you know, kind of put some parameters down, put some walls down and, 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 and to communicate some stability to, to the crew and to your executives and, and like the, 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 the people running the studio, whoever's paying for the movie. So like there's a political aspect to it that I never had to, you know, kind of uh, face as a, as a story artist, but I was in some of those rooms. So I got to see other directors kind of behave and, and negotiate those sorts of, um, personality so i think you know nothing really completely gives you the perspective of another job even in this industry but i think the idea of like kind of going into this position with some of that craft was was really helpful mm -hmm. and and it, it's not even just like you know understanding camera but it's like understanding performance understanding how to work with with the actors which you know being an animator really helped me because in, in a lot of ways like you know when you're sweat boxing, the best notes were the ones where a director, you know, either got an idea from your sequence and, and was like, you know, well, what if, what if we, you know, when you hear the word, what if that's, that's, the, that's an exciting thing. Um, it's it. And, and the hardest things is when like a director would, would grab your wrist and try to make you draw something that they see in their head that you don't see. So like, as a, as a director, like, like I could sort of be on the other side of that conversation and always try to engage my crew rather than make them feel like there was only one way to do something because as we know in life there isn't there's many ways and so you, you know the richness of having a crew is such a huge value in the job um so i, I guess yeah so i guess like being in the soup of whatever 
your art is, you know, whether it's live action or animation, I think, you know, coming from story, you know, layout camera into uh, animation into that position, you have a sense of what the tool set is you're working with and you can trust it. Does that make sense? It really does. Um, and it just shows how all of our craft are kind of intertwined. Like you cannot just be a, a supervisor or a director and just impose your, uh, your vision on everyone. I guess when you're directing or, or supervising, um, I guess especially directing, I mean, you hire people and if you hire them, uh, like you're supposed to trust them. And yeah, I think, I think there's a lot of ways to do the job. Like if you're, um, you know, if you're Stanley Kubrick, Kubrick and you're doing, you know, The Shining, <laughs> you, could be, you can be a tyrant because you're a genius. And unfortunately, I was never, I wasn't born a genius. So I need to hire people who are smarter than me to, to help, you know, make, make, the, make the thing good. And, and that sort of like, you know, that big tent approach has worked well for me. But I think there's a lot of ways to do the job. Like there's probably not one way to do it. It's important to kind of figure out sort of how your creative process works too by the time you get to that space. Yeah, speaking of <laughs> doing the, like multiple people can do the job different way. I know that I think your first experience directing something was co-directing with um, Cody Cameron, right? Yes, yeah. Cody. Um, <laughs> I'm so um, bad at names. Ah! <laughs> and yeah, you were co-directing on Cloudy 2, Cloudy with mm -hmm. Sense of Meatball 2. And then you recently you did The Willoughby's where you, in a way, solo directed the movie. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess this must have been two completely different uh, experiences. And can you talk about that a little bit? Like, how is it different to co-direct versus directing? Well, I think, you know, I, I, I was definitely, you know, uh, I would say, you know, co-directing on the second one, too, because I had a, I had, I had a, you know, I had a big crew and I had a lot of, um, a lot of support and I had, I had, you know, just um, Rob Lodermeyer was my co-director, um, who was, uh, you know, just completely um, you know, necessary in terms of like, our, our relationship and our and our collaboration was was so important. So like I, I guess where I'm waffling around here is I think collaboration is key for my creative process. So um, one of the things I learned a lot from Cody was just sort of how how big the job is. Like you know it takes us years to make something, and you know to have that sort of um, uh, person that you trust that allows you to get sick or allows you to have a bad day or allows you to you know kind of you know, kind of share the burden hey, in a way. Yeah, yeah. It's almost like like you're allowed to care about something in a way that you could have an honest conversation with somebody else. That's not uh, again, at least in terms of my experience with these relationships, is it's it, where they work well is when you can you can say anything to the other person and not be afraid of the repercussions of that. In a little ways, it's a bit like a marriage, right? And and because this process is so large with such big crews like having that kind of trust you know relationship at the center of 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 the the, the process is, is is key for your mental sanity also for the outcome of the final product so working with working with cody like cody was an amazing like he um he did the voice of um, uh, the three little pigs and uh pinocchio from the shrek movies so he's like a really funny kind of uh like um uh, intuitive voice actor so like working with our, our like bill Hader and andy sandberg and james Kahn, like cody came in with such a uh, an easy kind of bedside manner with 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 that side of the business i'd never done that before and so just watching him be in that space and watching how he executed um you know just that that creative process of riffing with these great comedians was was so helpful and it's like i think it's like anything it's like you if you have mentorship then you know i i think it's a very lucky lucky experience because you, you don't give up your own experience in terms of what makes you an artist but you're you're actually just learning what there's that old farmer saying like how you hold your tongue when you swing the hammer have you heard that <laughs> i you never know? heard it's that like, it's like how you do something is 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 sometimes as important as what you're doing you know what I mean? Like just, just how, how to be in that space. So, um, yeah, it was, it was awesome having that kind of, 
you know, opportunity to learn and, and also that trust relationship that you can you can you can be a human in that space. And, and certainly on, on Willoughby is like I think like like my editor Fiona Toth was like she's like your therapist or she was like my therapist, but also really in, in a lot of ways like a director like like, you know, she was owning that part of the process. And so like being an edit to me was like the, the place where you go to to chew on the puzzle and having that sort of those trust relationships all through your pipeline. So like Wes was the anim lead and like, you know, being able to sort of like let him own his department, but also like knowing how much he cared about the film when something was like not working or something needed to be fixed or we had a story change that, you know, happens all through the process. I could come to Wes and sort of be really honest with him in a way that allowed him to engage because he cared too. So it's, it, it is that, you know, that saying is like, it takes a village to raise a, raise a child. It, it's the same thing making a movie, like, especially when it takes you years. I'm not directing a movie, but usually more and more I'm directing more of the technical side of things mm -hmm. uh, with tech directing roles. And I know one thing that used to scare me is to to think like, what if I don't have the answer? And when you say like, oh, you walk into that edit room and uh, it's kind of where you kind of solve the puzzle. And I remember one thing that used to scare me is like, what if I don't have the answer? And I'm like, oh, I don't know. And I think with the years now, now I, I, I say it sometimes. I'm like, I just don't know how to solve that thing. <laughs> and I kind of give it Some, a day sometimes to, to think about those it. Those three and... words are like the best words. <laughs> I don't I don't know if you open up a conversation in a way that having the answer won't. It's like, give, give, me, the, give me some idea. Give me some time to think about it or give me something to... Sometimes, too, I, I find like, you know, creative um, fear is the enemy of creativity, right? And if you feel and I and I've definitely had moments, especially like with executives or with, you know, sometimes like, um, you know, the, 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 the money side of the of the business, like confidence is, is, is necessary because people will respond to confidence. But like if you can go into one of those spaces and and, you know, be confident and say, you know, we haven't figured this out yet. Sometimes that gets people excited and you can change the energy of a, of a, of a, of a moment as opposed to like letting that moment be a judgment space where you're being completely challenged. You can, you can turn it into a collaborative moment where you might get a great idea that you weren't going to get if you had to just defend it. Does that make sense? It really does. Especially the defended word <laughs> really makes, um, a lot of sense. Sometimes you just have to be open to 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 what yeah. people might have to say. And well, the other cool thing too is is and this is something I I think I was talking about this earlier today with a, with, a, with a group of friends. Like you know, the first time I directed a movie, I had a lot of anxiety, like like kind of crippling anxiety. And we all find our coping mechanisms for the for the stress of something like that. But like if I thought about sitting on seventy million dollars and you know a crew of four hundred people blinking at you. And uh, I often say, like, releasing a movie is like being strapped onto the front of a train, being hurtled into a wall of judgment. You know, like, you don't know how people are going to react to uh, to what you've made. And kind of being an introvert, it's it's like hell. Like, it's it's terrifying. Um, but like, you know, doing it the second time, I realized that anything that needs to be better will find its way into the process if you have an open mind. So like like what you decide on a Tuesday, if that's not the right decision, just wait till Thursday. You know, you might find the better idea. And it's like the worst thing you can do is not make a choice. So make a choice. And if it's wrong, you can always change it. That's the beauty of animation. Like we have this sort of craft kind of like stand up where we can manipulate and keep tweaking because of the nature of how we produce these things. So I think it's really um, that was a real lesson that I. I didn't know the first time I did it how much you can sort of learn and be forgiving to yourself in the process of learning and how if you stay calm and find a confidence in that, you can just continue the debate until you run out of time and money. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> money. I'm going to say Yeah, it's always, a, it's, a, it's a business. You got to know a show business, right? But. Um, Yeah, you have to find a balance between what is going to m allow you to make another movie and making your movie. <laughs> yes, yeah. Honestly, you, <laughs> your answers are really cool. Thank you for taking the time <laughs> to elaborate. What and when directing a movie, what is the everyday 
life in terms of like directing a, a movie? There's definitely like a, a, um, uh, a treadmill to the process. And I think it's a necessary treadmill because you're dealing with lots of, you know, lots of different departments and, and, and um, uh, people throughout the, the course of a day. Um, the way I like to structurally work stuff, um, and I think every, every artist is slightly different. So I would, I'm, I tend to be creative and, and kind of um, productive early in the morning or really late at night. Sometimes those two things don't work well together. So depending on the week, I have to kind of pick a side. But generally, like the middle of the day, starting around 10 o'clock all the way through, you know, kind of to, to closing time is, is you're working with the crew. Mm-hmm. And and those those moments are kind of like you're like a hummingbird. I kind of actually on Willoughby's, I, I never really had an office and I, I never had a, I didn't have a door that I could close. And I think that to me was um, part of it was this. It was a transient film and that we were making it in a couple different places. Um, like I was working at a studio in Burnaby and then we had a studio in in uh, on the Vancouver Island in uh, Duncan. And then I had a little studio in London, Ontario, my hometown. So I was kind of always on the road going between places. But I also found that really I lived in editorial. Like like you, I would spend as much time in that space as I could. So basically having a, a, a philosophy of never being able to close a door meant that I was kind of on, on the floor all day with, with the crew as much as possible. So uh, keep in mind, this is pre-pandemic. Uh, yeah, <laughs> of course. Yeah. <laughs> So like like the day was sort of like you'd roll from one department to the next and you would go from one sweat box to, you know, one review. And then, you know, a- anytime we would be coming towards a screening or, or, you know, say we were about to send the sequence into production, I would try to wall off time to, to, to be an editorial. But then, you know, generally I would I would write in the morning and then storyboard at night. So um, you know, once we get the sequences lifted, too, I would like to spend a lot of time and edit. And I just sit there with my Cintiq and, and we try stuff. And I think like... That to me is really, really where the movie gets solved. But while that's happening, you know, just kind of moving around throughout the the, the floor and just everything's happening at once, but nothing is necessarily finishing at the same time. So, like, you try to get as much of the, the departmental like machine rolling, and then use that kind of multi-department um, learning curve to help the final so like i'd see something out of effects that would make me think we should open up a shot in edit because you know there's a there's an element that's coming in so i'd go over to edit we'd open up a shot but that would affect music and then so like you've got these like moving pieces that are always kind of rippling around the film and i think the only way to really get an organic kind of spontaneity to that is to be in all departments as many departments as you can at once and so that's kind of what the day is sort of structured like is is to move around does that make sense? It really does. And not having a closed office to spend all the day in, I guess also maybe it must help not feeling too alone with your ideas. You know, when you have a problem, sometimes it's easy to just lock yourself in your office and try to think about it. But like yeah. you said, you would talk with FX, you would talk with animation department. And and uh, yeah, I think that's interesting. I always figured... Uh, I don't know, from the studios I visited often time, um, directing roles had a, 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 a office and, you know, just having the door, sometimes it can be intimidating to, to animators. So, uh, yeah, just knowing that you were out there, like kind of jumping around, uh, really makes it interesting of a perspective. Yeah. I don't know if it was premeditated, by the way. I think it just sort of ended up that way. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, wor- it, it, it worked out. Um, and sometimes you do need to close the door, especially if you're, you know, if you're dealing with um, sensitive kind of political things, but oh, like I course, always found that I could, I could get into a room to close. The door. I just don't want to come off as a hypocrite because somebody working on a crew would be like, well, you know, he sometimes went into rooms with closed doors. But I mean, you do, yeah, there's meeting like, rooms like, and stuff like, for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, but I really like just the idea of not having, yeah, not really having um, a place to, to run away to kind of allowed me to really just sort of be in just in the space with with where the film was being made you know as much as possible is this something you do again on another movie kind of have a similar concept of having lots of time just so. to run around <laughs> i think so yeah and I, and i think you know we'll see how the world ends up sort of you know changing because of covid 
Um, I mean, there's, there's a version of it that right now, I think, with the projects I'm working on, that it's, you know, it's a little bit more scheduled because you are on, um, on uh, you know, these Zoom calls and what have you. But, like, I think the... Uh, I think the um, the idea of like the door is always open, and, and if anybody has a problem, let's just get on and talk about it, as opposed to kind of you know premeditating scheduled checkpoints. Um, as I think that's the thing I'd like to try to create, because that for me is is the best way to learn is just as organic as possible. But and, um, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> and speaking of keeping it organic, I do remember from another workshop that you gave, mm -hmm. talking about how I think it was on Cloudy 1 or 2, um, and don't quote me on this, I think like on, on Wednesday evening, sometimes you'd have screening of the dailies or the weeklies mm -hmm. in that case. And if animators had a joke or something that they wanted to add to their scene, they were kind of welcome to try it and see if it would lift up and make people laugh. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought, and that that whole process literally like kind of blew my mind when you when I first heard it all these years ago. And it's really something I try to apply now that I'm working on other project. And yeah, just can you can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, like like working on on the Willoughby. So like we had um, you know, it wasn't as as well funded a film say as like a big budget Hollywood blockbuster. So we knew. We knew where the film was going to go. Like we knew it was going to be, um, you know, a, a, a film for 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 Netflix, and it was going to have that, you know, kind of home audience. And we also knew that the subject matter was a bit, uh, you know, a little dark and a little subversive. So, but we and we wanted to keep it that way. So we, you know, in terms of being efficient and understanding that we didn't have infinite resources, um, kind of implemented something that we had on that I learned on Cloudy Two, which was, like, we would let basically like the animator could take whatever swing they they felt was right for the character right for the scene in the blocking phase and we would look at blocking really early and we'd look at blocking you know as as even like live action reference that the animator would shoot just so we could have that creative conversation of what if and then as it went through the process of like developing into a shot and as the animator was making choices and committing to those choices like everybody was kind of in the lane of like participating with what that animator was experimenting with and I think that allowed the animator to feel creative um, but also like allowed us to you know have very honest conversations of like is this right for the character and early on in the film I think that's really important because you're trying to find stuff you know you're responding to um, design you're responding to um, you know the voice actors choices but like you know, if you look at the Willoughby, it's like the the, the father's throat gurgle. Oh like my that god! Was a, <laughs> that that was that was a pitch. You know, there's an interesting sound that was like coming from Martin Short and you know Scott Guppy. I think it was Scott Guppy. Uh, might I could be I could be wrong in that, but uh, I remember just like the animators were like playing with like what does that what does that look like? You know, how do we how do we make something out of that? And I think those choices. Uh, coming from a place of like letting somebody own it and letting someone have a second with it, it it's it's really important. You it's know, like it's a mating call for... kind of literal sound. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, but like I think uh, yeah. So like generally, it's like a good a good idea wins, and and that seems to be um, you know a pathway to, uh, to 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 good filmmaking if you can commit to it. If that makes sense, it really does. And brings uh, it kind of reminds me because I'm currently working on a short film uh, project with a low budget too because it's crowdfunded. Uh, oh, cool! Called Like a Daisy, and I'll, I can show you later. Like the animation is gorgeous, and I'm so grateful for working with all these amazing talent. And I'm leading the cleanup with my friend Ashley, and like we're a small, very close-knitted team and we don't have a physical studio because it's uh, all over the world and we have only huh? a discord channel as a studio and this also makes it so much different because everybody can be a bit more on board with things yeah and for the first time i'm sitting in edits 
uh, were like where we do the animatic and we check out if the storyboard and if the gags are working and uh, Fable or our director is like, is this funny? Like, tell me if it's funny or not. And <laughs> well, we've never been asked that question before as animator or cleanup artist. And yeah, so. it's, uh, you, you know, your crew is kind of like your first, your first audience, although they get tainted quick. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> even, even, even that, like, I, I find like, um, one thing that I always find is I tend to I guess it's like uh, the way that the brain works. Like, so if you get used to something, you, um, you know, you tend to, uh, it's hard to know when to stop poking, right? So when it comes to like, you know, the speed of, of, of how something will read to an audience, I will get tight, 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 and I'll try to get my timing as tight as possible. But then if you over tighten it, then the film starts to feel frenetic. And I find like, um, my animators are usually really good at sort of like hanging on because it's like their job is about time, right? Mm -hmm. Hanging on to like knowing that you need an extra few minutes or a, a few beats to kind of open up a shot for a reaction or whatever. But then even even with the animators, when they get used to a shot, they'll start, you know, you'll start hedging into those that that pregnant time. So that's why you got to keep keep finding a new audience. <laughs> that's oh, the trick yeah. is like, yeah, rolling audiences over the course of a few years. <laughs> And speaking of, I like how all these questions kind of intertwine. Speaking of rolling audience, um, a, lot, uh, a lot of things I see as well is people wanting to pitch their own shows, pitch their own movies and mm -hmm. project. And I think one thing that is really important is, like you say, have a rolling audience. Don't keep your idea to yourself for like too long because you get used to your idea and it's something that you, and, and I think the longest you get used to your idea the, the hardest it, it is maybe to adapt it and, and change yeah. it um, yeah I think it's um it's one of those things where it's um you know uh, there's an old saying you write you write the first draft for yourself and then you put it away and then you get cold and then you you rewrite it again for someone you trust like whether it's an editor or a, um, you know your spouse or whatever and then once once you get it to that place then you have to rewrite it for your audience and when you rewrite it for the audience that's usually like where the big rewrites are like where you're you know honing for for months and stephen king in his book on writing which is one of the, one of the best books i've ever read for process he talked about like he's he's very prolific but he's always got like five different scripts going or um like novels going he'll write really fast to get an, an idea down and put it away and not look at it for six months because he's got to get cold to his idea and i think that cold objectivity is like it it it, it fights the night you got to be naive to make something because you can't think about why you're going to fail because there's a lot of reasons to fail and they'll, they'll stop you from starting so you got to go in thinking you got the best idea in the world and the reality is you you don't nobody does like not your first idea is not the best idea so you got to get cold to the idea so you can turn it into the best idea and you got to do that work to kind of hack it out so to get cold to your idea you need perspective and because we're moving so fast and you have a budget the way you get perspective and this goes back to stand up is you have to say it out loud and you have to ask people in a way in whatever way you you, you can communicate to them give me your reaction um you you then look at the reaction as being the thing that you, you you need to learn from so it's all about learning you know what i mean and and while your idea that you started with on a on a monday mm -hmm. cut to three years later it's a, it's a three years later on a friday it's still the same idea and if and if you've done your job you've you've protected the the, the reason why you wanted to tell this story but along the way, you've just improved your communication skills and you've made the film into something that has a bit more flavor to it. It's like making soup. If you're making soup and all you do is cut one carrot into a pot of water and boil it, technically it's soup. It's not good soup. <laughs> it's not a soup that anybody wants to eat. Like it's better when you can put all the other stuff in there. And the more you can add, the more spices, the more flavors, the more like it's still the soup you started making. It's just better. So I, I, I don't know. Does that make sense? <laughs> I love the idea of comparing it to soup. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I had, I had an acquaintance who had a wonderful project, but kept it secret for like a year or two. And then when it was a big reveal, people were like, well, we don't get it. We, <laughs> we don't understand. Yeah. And then he was like, yeah. fuck. 
<laughs> have to go back. I'm like, yeah, well. Uh, so but people, but some, if you're sometimes, listening, sometimes, sometimes that's like the best reaction. Like sometimes, like as painful as it is, sometimes the hard screenings are the best ones for you. And ultimately, like your your friend, like yeah, maybe they've wasted some some time. Like they probably could have got that reaction earlier. Mm -hmm. But the fact that they got the reaction is good because some people wait till they're in the theaters to get the reaction. You know. Yep. Actually, one thing that could be interesting is the little story you had when you went to pitch the Willoughbys at Netflix. Because mm -hmm. I remember, and it's something I try to put into my students' head, is if you want to have an idea and you want to make it and work with it, I always think that you should be ready to present it whenever. Like, always try to have something ready because you, you can't prepare for a big pitch gig. But sometimes one of the best pitches you'll have is you didn't plan for it. And I and I think that's what happened to you for the Willoughby's, right? Yeah, they, they call it like the elevator pitch. Like, what's your elevator pitch? Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe like the, the, the idea, the story comes from, you know, somebody being in, in you know, uh, I think New York and you're, you're riding the elevator up with an executive and you just, you know, you have your one shot because you're, you're, you got a captive audience, you got the head of NBC sitting in the elevator with you. Can you pitch an idea in, you know, five seconds, in a minute, in, in two minutes? Like that elevator pitch is like really important for the sake of, A, understanding your, 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 your story, but also like, you know, getting somebody excited about investing in, in what you're trying to make. And, and the way I kind of look at it is, is actually to use another kind of marketing perspective is mm -hmm. what's your po what's your poster you don't pitch you don't pitch your story you pitch the poster like because the poster when somebody the actual movie? no no just like what's the idea of the poster so if there's a way to, like everybody knows i'm drawing like a dinosaur here or, or lizard thing everybody knows what jurassic park is right so jurassic park is a story about you know uh, a couple uh, who um, the, the the wife wants to have a kid and the the the, the, the guy is afraid of commitment and um, you know they end up going on a on a trip to an island uh, to uh, you know vet the legitimacy of the science behind this new idea which is it turns out to be very dangerous um, that's the most boring way to pitch Jurassic Park so if I was to pitch Jurassic Park like the poster I would say there's a there's an island full of dinosaurs and it's really awesome, but these dinosaurs have teeth and they're going to chase you. And, and <laughs> really this is the story about like, um, you know, it's a survival story, you know, in, in, in a prehistoric uh, world, but it's, it's happening now. That's what, you know, you, you see what I mean? Like, and, and again, I'm, I'm probably, you know, not necessarily uh, being really truthful in terms of how they would have pitched it. But like, like when I pitched the Willoughby's, I, I literally walk in the room and say, you know, this is a story about four kids that want to be orphans. The only problem is that they have parents, terrible parents. And that gets people interested. That was my hook, you know? Yeah, whenever I talk about pitching to, to friends and students, I always say you, you kind of have, not to lie, but it's like when you tell a story. Like, maybe not lie, but make it bigger than it seems. Like, don't just say that the Bullabies is about three kids, um... Uh, four kids, actually, because there's twins. <laughs> four kids <Yeah. laughs> going on an adventure to learn about family. No, no, you say, like, yeah, it's four kids who want to orphan themselves to live as orphans because apparently it's amazing. <laughs> so. Yeah, and, and, like, the, you find the audacity, like, that thing that makes it really kind of, um, you know, like, I've never seen that before. Like, you know, I mean, like, you know, another movie I worked on, like, Cloudy, it's, like, you know, uh, this is a disaster movie where food falls from the sky. That's all you need to say. And somebody's like, I'm interested. And then you start telling the story. So I it's just like opening up that door. And I think the other thing about pitching is like, um, always try to stay away from detail unless it's entertaining. And that's a really hard thing to know how to do. Mm -hmm. um, but like, ultimately, nobody gives that much of a crap about the detail. It's really about the hook. And so if you're telling a story that's emotional, like all of the information you present is really about getting to the to the to the point where your audience feels something. You want to make them feel your um, your your message without getting into the detail and the detail will just clutter that message. So if you think about everything as a joke, not that, not that 
every film, every story idea, everything has to be comedy. But the structure of a joke is you have a setup, you have a delivery, and you have your punchline. And the second you hit your punchline, you get out. That's it. So like pitching an idea, what's your punchline? Even if it's not a joke, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, so if the story is a tragic story about somebody's, um, you know, uh, descent into Alzheimer's, there's a moment where that person, you know, looks at their child and remembers the name. And that might be the emotional punch of the story. So, you know, that's your punchline. You work everything backwards from that to tell that story in a way that doesn't distract from that. Does that make sense? It really does. And I've been taking notes and we can make our own mm -hmm. poster after with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, it's so like, honestly, it's so nice to hear all of that because, you know, there's no school to learn pitching. I mean, you can maybe, maybe learn about it in school, but like you can't be, you can't really take classes on how to be a professional pitcher. You kind of yeah. have to, to learn it and to own it. And I, I do think anybody who wants to be like in the world of pitching um, should take an acting class, should take an improv class. Very interesting. Because yeah. I think it's enter it's entertainment. So if you can't be entertaining, and I, I, the other thing, like when I'm pitching storyboards, I always tell people, or one of the things that I was taught um, when I first started doing feature stuff was, you know, don't pitch your drawings. Nobody cares about your drawings. Pitch the movie. So you pitch the time and you don't you don't talk about any of the de the detail is just detail and not as with your catch it or they won't that's that's your job as an illustrator to make that do its job without you having to talk about it so if i'm pitching a sequence i try to imagine how it's going to get cut like is, is is there a pause here is like you know varying your timing uh your volume like you, know, you come into the common and bam the door opens so like you want to make sure that your audience feels that <laughs> and and i think that to me is like the um uh, you know that ability to kind of not be afraid to uh i guess just own that entertainment value is is uh, is really you know it's a good thing to learn and I, and i do think like as much as like i don't think an acting class is, is a prerequisite i think a bit of that time spent doing an immediate call and response will train your brain to sort of be okay with that in the very slow motion thing that we do if that makes sense yeah and i don't know if you're gonna agree with that because <laughs> like not everyone can get acting classes like when i was a kid and when i was a teen like acting classes were like it's not everyone who has access to that but, that's true. That's, um, and I was in college when when I first did. It. Although I think I think I did like um, like plays and stuff. And I, I, even if it's just like Toastmasters or like um, you know going to a bar and telling telling stories. Like I, I I think you have to. I mean, whatever tools you have, you use, right? Um, but uh, I think like if you have an opportunity to try something that's out of your comfort zone, in that place that's immediate that that is anybody who's going to be a story artist or even an animator i would say it's, it's valuable whenever you can get your opportunity to try it because i was gonna say yeah i've pitched a few things and and like i love like i love to share ideas and stuff and i know i wasn't good at it uh before and but like now i have a youtube channel and i'm able to share ideas and pitch stuff but mm -hmm. uh one of the things that really helped and i didn't know while I was doing it, but it's only looking back. Like I've worked in a summer camp for 10 years and I ah. had to entertain kids for like month and month. And you know, kids, they're a very hard audience. If, they're if you're bad, they're not going <laughs> to listen to you. And yeah, they're the best. That's the best. It makes them <laughs> awesome. They're like, they, they're not, they don't have to be polite. So I guess if you want to tell stories in animation, of course, you don't have to just as the same as you don't like nobody has the same path. But, you know, if you have that as an option, having to maybe do activities and having to entertain groups of kids, you know, if you want to tell story for kids, you know, kind of working with them can really help out. So I, I would I mean, you recommend acting classes and and in the same vibe, I recommend um, working with kids and having to <laughs> entertain a group of 20 of them and have mm -hmm. them listen to your story you're gonna learn the do's and don'ts about storytelling <laughs> to yeah <a> absolutely <laughs> absolutely 
sometimes it's a bit more accessible than uh, acting class. Though I really want to get into acting class. That seems amazing. <laughs> Maybe I'm going to find something. Or even like just get a group of friends and just do improv. You know, just improv is amazing. It's so stressful at first, but after that, you kind of learn your cues and what you're comfortable with. And Actually, you were talking about playing uh, board games and stuff at Christmas, and like, there's a lot of like even that. Like, it's funny. A lot of my friends um, still play D and D and still Dungeon you know, and Dragons. Yeah, like I think there's the there, there, anything in that world, anything in that world of like putting on putting on a voice and pretending like you're in another person's skin is like super helpful for what we do. And, and um, talking yeah. about pitching your not only your ideas, but now that I think about it, when you when you storyboard, you're you're pitching all the time because you want to get your point in your story, uh, your point of view on the story across. And when mm -hmm. you were talking earlier about the beats and stuff, it just reminds me. Um, yeah, it reminds me when you were uh, doing that workshop and you kind of pitched us a scene of open season, the one with the hunter hunting the deer right. into the cabin. And you're right. not you're not an editor. You um, by craft when you storyboard, usually you just well you just you draw your drawings, and then somebody else edits them. And often I hear storyboarder saying like, "Oh no, I'll never time my drawing. That's not my job." But actually, I think do you think that's a actually do you think that's an interesting exercise for a storyboarder to 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 like pitch their ideas? Because um, when you did the open season thing, you were playing the, the panels one after the other, but you were kind of telling the story as you were um, making the panels play. And that was super, super uh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. You, uh, yeah. You should always pitch to, to, to time. And I think um, I, I love the cross pollination that happens when you hand your ideas over to another artist. So like, like, you know, um, you know, editor, the editor comes in with their, with their point of view. And then what that does is it gives you that thing that Stephen King talked about, like getting cold your idea. You give it to another artist who is not as invested, didn't stay up all night drawing this stuff. They're going to, you know, kind of see things that maybe you missed and maybe um, something that they miss and what you, what, what you thought was important, you could debate and try to figure out how to get it back in and maybe figure out why they missed it. But like, ultimately, like, I think any phase, like, like, when I'm storyboarding and I'm going to act with a character, the animator, when they get to that character, is going to make different choices. But I'm acting like there is no animator. I'm acting like I'm at the end of the line because that's how I commit to what I'm making, right? So I think it is both things. Like, like you, you, you should be able to share that idea and let others contribute to it because that's how it gets better. Or that's how you figure out what you want to fight for and what, what's important. But you can also, like... Um, I think if you're not thinking of it like it's film, you're not making a film. Do, do you know what I mean? Like you got to think of it like I'm sitting in a dark room. Like anytime I, I go in front of an audience to pitch a, a storyboard, I'm imagining mm -hmm. that we're sitting in a theater and we're watching this. And any mistakes I'm going to make right now are mistakes that we should be making now because we haven't. We're not really in a theater. We're in that space of imagination. But oh, if yeah. I don't sell it like we are in a theater, then how do I know what's working and what's not working, right? And like storyboard and stuff, this this is a it it, it is part of the the team project. So when you pitch your ideas, and I mean, uh, you you kind of have to choose your your battles at one point. I think if you really believe in an idea, uh, of course you can try to push it. But sometimes, I guess it's also good to listen to the feedback and maybe if not scrap your ideas, try to kind of adapt it to. Um, another yeah. way to see it. This is why improv is 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 a really um, like improv is kind of horrible sometimes to watch because <laughs> it's not always entertaining. But like to actually do it, it's that yes and culture. Does that make sense? Like you know, um, yes, and you never you never say no. Never say no. No is a bad word. <laughs> <laughs> so if you don't like an idea, you go yes. And what if we did this? You know what I mean? Or or what if we pivoted this way? Like like that to me is like the space where you can create. Uh, it's like fertilizer in the soil. You know, you need a lot of shit to go into the soil to make things grow, and and that's 
on its own right, you know, a wheelbarrow full of, full of animal poop is not a nice thing. But when it makes strawberries, that's a good thing. It's right? like building your ideas. Uh, like the idea gets built because everybody like instead of building over somebody else's idea, you kind of try to build with. So yes, that's it. That's it. And it doesn't mean like I'm not talking about a utopia where every idea is good or mm -hmm. every idea matters. Like at some point you, you make choices. But the um, the ability to kind of create a space where people will share and collaborate with you allows you to get more more ideas and more ideas lead to better choices in theory. There's my wheelbarrow full of poop. I thought you were going to draw the, the hat they had made with a, a pasta strainer. How did it look? Like it... In the, in the movie they had like oh the, in uh yeah yeah there's uh the red light uh, thing yeah, it was, uh, the, the this metaphor hunter <laughs> wow uh, <laughs> i didn't remember it but <laughs> nice catch yeah, it's like the flint lockwood diatonic uh flint dis something nuclear flint this mid defense i the think fun. that's how we spelled it i think that's how we spelled it i'm probably wrong oh uh, well <laughs> It's fine. It's well, fine. And so um, the last question I want to—I uh, liked. I, I. So the last question I asked to everyone who came on this event this year is kind of the final words. Um, as artists, we tend to be like sensitive people, and we deal with our fair share of kind of um, rough passes. And um, do you have any advice for artists going through maybe lack of motivation, or you know, when when nothing works? And I know we're not health professional, are we? And the only person who can really help you is usually a um, mental health doctor, <laughs> which we are not. But by sharing just our experience, maybe we can help out other go through that. I mean, I think it's one of those things where um, it's really important to be a human being. And I know that sounds super, super flippant and not necessarily. But to kind of piggyback on what you're saying, I think, you know, it's good to know when you're feeling, um, you know, hard on yourself or when you're feeling your motivation wane or when you're feeling burnout. And it's good to get in front of that and try to forgive yourself and, and find help. Um, it took me a long time to, to, to get therapy. <laughs> and, you know, it's like, cause I, you know, raised on a farm in Southern Ontario, it's like talking about your feelings isn't something that we do. You work when you're sick, you work when you're hurt, You, like showing up is 90% of the of, of, of the value system that I grew up with. And I think that value system is good and it's important. And I, and I still have that value system, but also like, it's okay to have a bad day. It's okay to need to talk to somebody. It's okay to say, I shouldn't draw for a little while. I was just talking to um, a friend of mine who's a production designer, Celine, who did um, over the moon. And she talked about like, after she finishes a movie, she doesn't, she goes away and tries not to draw for a while. She gives her brain that chance to rest. And it's some like people time. are, yeah. Like and I, I, for me, like I like both. After the last two movies, I, I I went back into like storyboarding and writing because to me, it's like working on someone else's idea is really just rewarding, and it gets my brain to sort of just like to let go of like being in charge, to let go of like being afraid of what you're doing like like and I, I i i maybe afraid's the wrong word but like you know it's like that fight or flight you got to get you got to get your body to a place where you're not hanging on to the tension from the thing that just happened you gotta you gotta release that and you gotta find a way to forgive yourself and give yourself the time to, to release that so that way you can start something else and sometimes like i, I, I remember being a young artist and i would sit at my desk and and hate myself for not being creative or not being able to draw or I'd fight a sequence or I'd fight a drawing and it just wouldn't work as I've gotten into my middle ages like I'm 45 now I know very quick to go for a walk and that's just that's one of those life lessons of just like I'm not going to be productive right now because my, my head's scrambled I need to go for a walk I need to go uh, go for a run I need to go for a bike ride I need to go spend some time quiet in the woods I need to go have a drink with a friend Like, I think you gotta let yourself be a human being and whatever way it is. And whether you like to read or whether you like to watch a movie or whether you like to, um, you know, exercise or dance or, or, and I feel it's always job, the kind of things that you do too late. Weather vein of emotion. What's that? Oh, I was gonna say, it, I feel it's always the thing you do, not too late, but when you do it, you're like, oh, why didn't I go take that world? Like, 
a yeah. half an hour ago <laughs> and yeah so don't don't I be think, afraid and i think there's a lot of self-help and a lot of awareness now so like this is not necessarily rocket science and i think but i do think um i do think we are like weather veins of, of emotion that's our job is to be empathetic and to be um you know the find the funny in the dark to find the dark and the funny to find you know uh empathy for every character even your villains even your heroes that are like you know wrong for half the movie you have to love them and for us to be conduits of characters we have to be out in the world we have to have conversations with people we have to and we have to be um kind to ourselves and let ourselves be okay too so anyways that's my that's my soapbox right there (laughs) yeah thank you for sharing it's very very interesting and uh yeah unless you have a final word i think this will be until next time (laughs) until next time well anytime you want to have a chat about anything you just ping me let me know i uh, i would love to come back on this is fun to draw i've not done this before thank you thank you for coming it was a nice hour of uh knowledge sharing and spilling <laughs> we will uh we'll, we'll, we'll talk to you soon and uh, stay safe and i hope everything is uh, is okay with your christmas and your holidays or your hanukkah kwanzaa uh, 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 uh midsummer no midwinter midwinter um free winter uh the the <laughs> uh the, the syrup season uh, yeah, phenom, bobsledding, all the stuff, everything. Have a nice hike. <laughs> yeah, talk to you later. Eh? See you. Bye.